Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you, uh, depending on which part of the globe you're joining us from today. My name is Anherid Lang. I'm Executive Director of the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection, which we call PHAP or PHAP for short. And I'm very happy to be serving as your host and moderator for today's special event. As many of you, I believe, know, uh, PHAP has been organizing an extensive series of these online presentation and discussion events as part of the as part of our support to the World Humanitarian Summit Global consultation process. Uh, but today's event is a special one uh, looking at, as you know, the power of business in the Ebola response. And this is a special event in cooperation with the Summit Secretariat, also business in the community, and the OCHA private sector section of the Resource and Mobilization Branch. And we're very happy to have the opportunity to host all of you for today's discussion. Uh, I've taken note that um, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in today's event. And we're really happy to see a lot of new uh, people joining the discussion today who have not been part of our pre previous events. So a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, and just noting that our 100 our person room is already full. So if you have any other colleagues uh, who have been planning to attend the event, uh, you should t tell them to check their email. They'll have a link waiting for them there now with instructions uh, as to how to access uh, the virtual overflow seating. Uh, we have live YouTube streaming of today's event for those who aren't able to get into the room. Uh, so with that, I'm going to move through just a few quick points since we do have so many new people joining us uh, on the platform today. Just a few points about how we run things for these virtual events. Uh, so moving first to the question box. So I think uh, you've all discovered the chat. I can see everyone introducing them there, with, uh, in, in introducing themselves there, which is terrific. Um, so the chat, as you can see, is for an open discussion. For questions that you'd like us to pose to the panel on your behalf, please use the question box. Um, those will then be directed to us, and we can bring them in in the Q&A and discussion. So please do make use of that throughout the event. Also the polls. So you've also all discovered uh, these two poll questions and now three uh, poll questions in front of you on the screen. Uh, right now we're just asking some basic profile questions about your professional affiliation, uh, the particular sector that you're working in. Throughout the event, we're going to be posting poll questions that relate to the discussion. And we encourage you to take a look there, provide your input. And this really gives us another uh, great way to get instantly the sense of, uh, of the opinions, the experience, the perspectives in the room. So please do take advantage of that uh, level of engagement in addition to the chat and the Q&A. I also, of course, want to mention that we have a live Twitter feed ongoing uh, courtesy of a member of the PHAP team here in Geneva. Uh, so if you're a Twitter user, uh, you can find us at PHAP forum and using hashtag reshapeaid. And then finally, as I mentioned, if you do have connection problems, there's an alternative uh, means for accessing the audio portion of today's events. You can access the live streaming at phap.org uh, and then the rest of the link as you see there on your screen. OK, and we're really pleased to have a number of excellent speakers with us uh, looking at a wide variety of really current uh, activity going on around the private sector uh, um, contribution to the Ebola response. Uh, we have with us Matthew Hochbruckner, who's the business partnership advisor in the private sector section of the Partnerships and Resource Mobilization branch uh, in OCHA, one of our partners for today's event. We also have with us John Pender, who's Vice President uh, for Global Health, Global Health in GlaxoSmithKline's uh, Government, Government Affairs Department. Um, we also have joining us Joe Ruiz, who's Corporate Grants Manager with the UPS Foundation and Director of the UPS Humanitarian Relief Program. Also Alan Knight, General Manager for Corporate Responsibility at ArcelorMittal. Craig Friedrichs, Program Director uh, focusing on the M Health program in the Mobile for Development uh, part of G GSM, and Sue Adkins, who's International Director at Business in the Community, another one of our partners for today's event. And now I believe we have the audio 
uh, all set up so that we can move into our first presentation. Um, and just a quick look at the time frame here. Uh, we're going to have, as you can see, a number of presentations. Uh, we'll be trying to keep them uh, on the short end of things, but thankfully we do have uh, an hour and a half for today's event, so we can really hear from all six uh, of our guest speakers on the panel and then still have a good amount of time for Q&A uh, and discussion in the second half of the event. I have uh, reviewed our registration information and I see many of you um, have important questions you'd like to bring in, uh, important examples from your own work. So uh, rest assured we will have plenty of time uh, for that at the end of the event. And so with that, I think we'd like to turn to Matt and uh, give you the floor for your presentation. So Matt, I think you're live. I'll give the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. First, let me apologize. Uh, we had hoped to have uh, Karen Smith, who is uh, currently deployed uh, with UNMIR with the UN mission uh, to Monrovia, but she was pulled into another meeting at the last minute. I'm joining you from uh, New York. Uh, but I am uh, currently seconded from UN OCHA to the new mission uh, that has been set up by the General Assembly in order to help coordinate um, the UN and uh, the broader international response on Ebola. So, and my focus is on the private sector engagement. And I'd like to start just by uh, thanking all those companies uh, that have already been um, engaged uh, both on the ground and through making contributions and providing ideas. Uh, we've seen already an unprecedented level of business engagement uh, on, this, on this crisis. And I think it just reflects the growing severity and the recognition that uh, this is not a response that can, is, 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 uh, can be addressed without the full scale in, uh, engagement of, of, of uh, a wide variety of, of, of actors. Um, the, the mission uh, and, and the UN had, had launched last month a, a new strategy, a six-month emergency strategy that, that is geared towards uh, doing five things. It's stopping the outbreak, it's treating the infected, it's ensuring essential services, it's preserving stability, and it's preventing outbreaks in other countries. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into all the statistics. I know those of you that are on the call have already been closely interested in this, uh, in this issue. Um, you, know, you know many of them, but uh, you know, the latest is that we have 9,005 uh, 9, cases um, uh, with 4,499 uh, 4, 4, deaths reported uh, thus far. Uh, but more dramatically, uh, the UN estimates that we can expect un up to 10,000 new cases per week by December uh, 1st, and, and if, if, if uh, current projections uh, remain as, as they are. Um, and therefore, the, the focus uh, really ha needs to be on the, on the, on the, on the next 60 days and, and the critical interventions that need to take place. Just to address the first two objectives that, that the UN has, stopping the outbreak and treating the infected, uh, WHO, the World Health uh, Organization, advises that we do four things collectively, identify and trace contacts, manage uh, manage the contacts, ensure safe burials, and provide people with information that they can use to protect themselves. Within, we've, we've been setting new targets as well. Within 60 days, we need to ensure that 70% of infected people are in care facilities, and 70% of burials are done without causing further infection. All this needs to be done um, uh, within the next 60 days. If we don't reach those, uh, those targets, we expect the numbers will spike even greater. And so we're in a race against time to prevent avoidable deaths and the further spread. Uh, the UN anticipates we will need thousands of additional beds across, uh, um, three, uh, across the, the three affected countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and, and uh, Liberia. And we'll need more staff to operate them. Staff need to be trained so that they don't fall sick, and they need to be paid and properly equipped. We're in need of uh, more diagnostic laboratories um, capable of uh, processing 100 samples per day. Uh, we need uh, burial teams to go from 50 to 500. We need more protective, uh, personal protective equipment and chlorine sprayers to, to disinfect. Um, with every day that passes, uh, the number of sick people increases, uh, creating a greater need for response. 
We need more contact tracing. We need more trained staff with motorcycles and more cell phones. Uh, we need to improve the supply chain and improve the, uh, the transportation access that's assets that we're accessing. And we need more medical support and staff and security arrangements. Um, all of this obviously points to the fact that we need more partners. We need to broaden the, the partnerships that we've been working with. And the private sector is, uh, uh, you know, it, seen as a critical player in this. Recognizing that, that time is our biggest enemy, uh, UNMIR has, has uh, the, the UN's mission uh, has quickly scaled up its efforts in the last 30 days, um, sending out uh, 90 new staff to support the UN, uh, NGO, and, 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 and government uh, officials that are on the ground that have been responding to this crisis for months. And the, the main role of, of UNMIR, the, the mission, is to play the role of crisis manager. Uh, we're working with all these partners to put in a plan, set clear objectives, and put forward uh, the, the activities necessary to achieve these objectives. Um, as we speak, there's a four-day planning mission that's taking place right now in Accra, where the uh, where UNMIR is 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 uh, ha has a headquarters, uh, and that we are quickly scaling up the, um, the 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 capacity across the three countries, not just in the capitals of Monrovia and uh, Freetown and, and Conakry, but across the affected areas up country. Um, again, we know we can't stop Ebola by ourselves. It's going to take new partnerships um, that, we've, that we can build upon from, from previous experiences, but scaling them to a level that we've not yet uh, we've done in the past. Um, uh, we pre created uh, last, uh, the, on 30th of September, a business engagement guide um, that calls on businesses uh, to do uh, essentially three things. First, we are uh, looking from, from the private sector for financial contributions. Cash is always the uh, easiest way to get uh, supplies and, and, and critical services in country um, and made available as quickly as possible. A special trust fund uh, has been set up by the Secretary General that we're accepting contributions to. And of course, we encourage continued contributions to all the operational agencies that, that are working on the ground, both the UN and the NGOs. The second thing that we need from, from private businesses is uh, the donation or the, the provision of, of, of in-kind materials and direct uh, service uh, support. And we need these things to be uh, reported. Um, we're already working closely with three main sectors uh, in, in, in this industry, the health sector, the telecommunications sector, and the logistics uh, sector. And, and I think we'll be hearing from our speakers in a few minutes uh, about some more details on each of these areas. And then finally, what we need is uh, to have joint uh, public messaging, joint advocacy, and solution finding. Uh, we know that uh, businesses carry a strong voice within their communities and globally, and we need those, the, you know, the, the call for, for, for common messages to be, to be uh, uh, amplified um, in, at all opportunities that we have, including at the World Economic Forum and other opportunities uh, bringing together global leaders. Our goal is to continue to uh, identify and share the, the key gaps and asks on the ground um, we will continue to work very closely with the uh, coalitions. Uh, we have on the line uh, uh, Alan Knight from the EPSMG, which is a coalition of companies working in West Africa. We're already working closely with them, and we, we hope that that, um, that coalition will continue to grow and strengthen and perhaps include uh, countries in the, in the, thus far uh, unaffected uh, by the crisis but at risk um, in, uh, in, in West Africa. And we're looking to bolster the, the relationships that we have and, 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 and expand on the, um, the, the work that we're doing with the health sector and, and the mobile um, and the telecom sector. Already the planning with the mobile industry is allowing for uh, the provision of equipment, the setting up of standards for two-way communication with affected communities, and setting up systems so that we can provide mobile credits to health workers and, and, and others that, uh, that will require resources going forward. 
so uh, we are heartened, again, by the engagement of the, of the private sector. Um, we at, in, the, in the UN stand ready to um, listen and, and hear uh, from, from all of you what uh, you can bring uh, to the response. And obviously, we look to coordinate this closely in, in, with all of our partners, with the national governments, um, uh, in order to address this crisis. Again, time is of the essence. Um, the faster that we can make those connections between businesses, uh, uh, what businesses have to offer, and uh, what the UN and, uh, and others uh, prioritize on the ground, the, the, the more quickly we can address and prevent this uh, uh, crisis from spreading. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, and thanks so much for uh, laying out the, the groundwork for this discussion today. Uh, we're just doing a quick Um, so thanks, thanks very much, Matt. And we're going to move now quickly to our next speaker, John Pender from GlaxoSmithKline, uh, because I understand that he will have to uh, dash in just a few minutes. So I believe we've got your audio set up. I'm just waiting for the thumbs up from my colleague. Yes, thumbs up. So I'm giving you the floor, John. Over to you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and I apologize in advance for having to uh, dial off this uh, webinar early. Um, First of all, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for setting up this webinar uh, on this very important subject and for the opportunity to say a few words uh, about the key role of the health industry in the fight against uh, Ebola. Um, we just heard from Matt how uh, the private sector can contribute in, in, in terms of cash, in terms of in-kind donations, and in terms of advocacy support. But obviously, those of us working in the health uh, sector have um, specific uh, contributions that we can make. Um, but I think the webinar provides us with a chance to, to, for us all to think about and identify our contribution to help address this unfolding crisis. So working with the WHO and other partners, GSK is committed to playing a key role in the global response to the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. And our efforts concentrate on investing in research and development to accelerate the development of our candidate vaccine and also contributing to the humanitarian uh, response. Uh, and I thought I'd just uh, give you some background on both of these areas. In September, we announced the formation of a new international consortium involving GSK, the Wellcome Trust, the UK's Medical Research Council, the University of Oxford, and UK's Department for International De uh, Development, DFID, aimed at accelerating the development of our Ebola vaccine. Facilitated by this consortium, the vaccine, which we are co-developing with the US NIH, has recently started the first human trials in both the US and the UK, and just last week in Mali. Together, these phase one studies will look to see that the vaccine does not cause unforeseen side effects, and that it generates a good immune response to the Ebola in humans, to the Ebola virus in humans, before it can be evaluated in larger at-risk populations. At this early stage of its development, it's too soon to know exactly when the vaccine might be more broadly available. But if all goes well, we expect to have the initial results of the phase one studies before the end of 2014, and these results will inform the next steps in the development program. The consortium funding will also help GSK to manufacture a new bulk vaccine, which should yield sufficient doses to conduct an accelerated phase two program to demonstrate vaccine safety and efficacy. We hope to commence these trials early in 2015, um, and they will include high-risk populations such as frontline health workers in the three affected countries in Sierra, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Um, and it, in effect, will be uh, like running phase two and phase three trials in parallel. If the trials are successful, we will be in a position to significantly increase production to help the WHO combat this epidemic and prevent future ones. And we're working with other partners and stakeholders to accelerate the development of manufacturing at an industrial scale. But this will take several months. In addition to our work on the vaccine, since the escalation of the outbreak in April, we have so far donated £430,000 in cash contributions for the three countries most affected. This includes funding for Save the Children to enable them to continue and scale up their work, supporting those affected and working to reduce the spread of the virus, particularly over the vital next 90 days. It also includes donations to AmeriCares and Direct Relief, which are being used to cover the cost of purchasing and delivering PPE, that's personal protective equipment, for frontline healthcare workers. 
Um, in, in line with what Matt has said, I'd like to reinforce the importance of cash donations here. In this very fast-moving situation, many organizations on the ground need cash to provide them with the flexibility required to procure what they need when they need it. However, for many good reasons, there has been a move away from simplistic cash handouts by companies to more sophisticated approaches to philanthropy. This means that companies now find it harder to provide unrestricted funds, and this risks slowing down the response. Alongside our cash donations, we are significantly increasing our medicines donations. We have donated supplies of GSK products for Sierra Leone and Liberia worth more than £500,000 to our partners AmeriCares and Project Hope. These shipments include antibiotics, which will be used to help patients who are vulnerable to infections within the Ebola-affected regions. We continue to work closely with partners on the ground and will provide further assistance as needed, fully aligned with WHO's guidelines. I'd like to take this opportunity to comment on the great work of BITC, Business in the Community. BITC play an important role in convening business and inspiring, supporting and challenging them on the corporate social responsibility and sustainability agenda, including international disaster relief and humanitarian action. And we are delighted to have been involved in the uh, BITC recent research and publication on international disaster relief, business unique, business's unique contribution. On the business response to Ebola, BITC have been playing a key coordinating role with DFID and other stakeholders. In conclusion, I'd like to reinforce that the private sector has a vital role to play in fighting this outbreak, but also in ensuring that the local societies and economies continue to function effectively. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this uh, from other speakers, especially Alan. On GSKI's behalf, we will continue to review our efforts and to pursue novel approaches to tackle Ebola. And we encourage all companies in all sectors, as well as the broader international community, to similarly consider what more they can do to contribute to fighting this dreadful disease and supporting the affected communities. Thank you. And thank you very much, John. Uh, we really appreciate your contribution today um, and, of course, the contribution of GSK um, to the response. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in for you, but I think we may um, have to follow up with you after the event and see if we can uh, get your inputs to the report um, uh, rather than uh, keep, uh, keep you on the line today, as I know you have to run. But thanks very much for your time and for being with us. Um, so You're very well. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, so we're going to move uh, to our next speaker. We're uh, turning to Joe Ruiz, uh, who's with the UPS Foundation. Um, I'm just going to make sure we have Joe coming onto the line. Uh, so just briefly, Joe Ruiz is Corporate Grants Manager with the UPS Foundation and Director of the UPS Humanitarian Relief Program. He's responsible for efforts to enhance the disaster preparedness and response capabilities of the humanitarian community through key partnerships in the public and the private sector that can benefit from UPS's extensive logistical expertise and financial resources. Uh, Joe, very happy to have you with us today, and you have the floor. Thank you, and uh, I also want to say uh, thanks to the organizers for having this call, UPS like GSK, uh, is um, uh, on the front lines trying to uh, make sure that this uh, initiative uh, gets the uh, a proper attention in all of our communications um, as we try to amplify the importance and the message uh, of, of the importance of the business community to respond uh, to this initiative. We're, we're also very committed to playing a key role in this response through our logistics expertise. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Matt, um, the UPS and the UPS Foundation have provided funding, in-kind support, uh, logistics expertise, um, and again, trying to uh, amplify the initiative. We've been collaborat collaborating with our NGO partners, including uh, many of the UN agencies that are, I'm sure, are on the call, UNICEF, World Food Program, uh, UNOCHA. Uh, we are um, working through our uh, World Food Program logistics emergency team uh, to address, uh, with our competitors, by the way, to collaborate uh, in a way that uh, is meaningful to uh, support uh, the global logistics cluster 
through uh, cash donations to enable the cluster to set up their West African operations. Uh, at present, uh, for any of uh, the uh, businesses that are on the call, they are currently looking for warehouse capacity in, uh, in, in airports in the three uh, primary countries, but also in, uh, in Ghana and Senegal, where they're setting up their uh, key operations. We're also working very closely within the U.S. with the CDC Foundation um, to help provide um, working also with uh, tremendous customers of ours like Henry Schein, who's on the call today, to, to support shipments of uh, personal protective equipment um, and working closely with other NGOs uh, to provide um, ocean uh, ground shipments like MedShare, AfriCare, and Direct Relief International. So we've been providing um, in-kind support to many of our NGO partners. I'd also like to uh, mention one of the organizations who's helped create an, uh, an air bridge from the United States, AirLink, that um, is providing capacity for corporations understanding that there is a need, a continuing ongoing need uh, for um, supplies, personal protective equipment into the region. Uh, they have been providing uh, through a, a generous grant from the Paul Allen Foundation um, air uh, capacity um, out of the U.S. and Europe. I believe they have another um, flight that may be coming in November. I wanted to make everybody aware of that. Also, as you said, that cash is, is most important because it can be used quickly. I also want to highlight um, the Center for Disaster Philanthropy Ebola Fund that uh, is available, that uh, is collecting donations from uh, various corporate and private foundations and community foundations to uh, apply to the impacted area. So again, I, I just want to say that UPS is very committed through the uh, UPS Humanitarian Relief Program. Uh, the UPS Foundation continues to work with our partners uh, to, to meet the needs and fill the gaps that have been identified through many of the uh, uh, calls such as this one that are providing invaluable information to the business community. So I want, again, I want to thank the organizers for, uh, for having this call and, and making us aware of the ongoing situation in the area. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to be moving right along to our next um, panel presentation. Uh, we're turning to Alan Knight, who is with, oh, sorry. Um, I see. I've just learned that uh, that Alan is going to be coming in a few minutes later. So we're going to be uh, going uh, then right away to Craig uh, Friedrichs, who's joining us, uh, as I mentioned at the start of the event from uh, the GSM Association, GM, GSMA. OK. OK, very good. Um, so uh, Dr. Friedrichs is Director of Health at GSMA and is a former trauma physician and biotech analyst, uh, now heading up a global team that brings together the mobile industry and health stakeholders to improve health outcomes in emerging markets. Um, and we're going to be hearing from Craig today um, on a couple of points. He's going to be looking at uh, the active facilitation um, required by multi-sectoral partnerships uh, and also issues of, uh, of, of response timelines uh, and the relationship with uh, coordination efforts. So I'll just wait for the thumbs up again from my colleague, and then we'll turn to Craig. Okay, Craig, let's try your audio. Are you on the line? Okay, so it looks like we are going to have to uh, work again on the audio for Craig. Um, apologies for that. In the meantime, uh, Sue, if you don't mind, we're going to turn to you next. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce you very briefly uh, again. So we have on the line with us today Sue Adkins uh, with BITC, an organization uh, mentioned by a couple of our other panelists already today. Uh, 
Um, Sue is the International Director at Business in the Community, BITC, and having a background in business, she is responsible for BITC's international strategy, mobilizing business action on corporate responsibility and sustainability. Soon ha Sue has worked with companies and NGOs throughout Europe, North and South America, Africa, and Australasia to help them develop their corporate social responsibility and sustainability strategies, as well as their partnerships. Um, so Sue, I'm going to give the floor to you to both introduce um, BITC uh, and some of the particular issues uh, you're highlighting uh, currently around the Ebola response. Over to you, Sue. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very, very glad to be here and, and very grateful for everybody who's spoken so far and given such fantastic insight. Um, so I just, a lot of people on the call won't know who Visitors in the Community are, so just Visitors in the Community in 30 seconds. Um, we're, we're also a charity that um, our president is His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and it's been around for about 33 years working on corporate and, um, response, well, cor corporate um, social responsibility and sustainability. And um, we are a, a, an organization with about 8, 850 members, business members, and thousands of others in our, in our network. And we are very much focused on business mobilization, business for good, and trying to get that moving at, at a greater, faster pace. Um, from an international point of view, we uh, work around and champion the benefits of corporate responsibility everywhere. And point, from that point of view, in the context of this conversation, we very much have been focusing on international disaster relief and very concerned to mobilize and, and better organize business and encourage business to be better organized and better partnered with the humanitarian aid agencies to, to deliver greater, faster um, support for disasters. We've just recently um, done a, a report that we launched and um, encourage you to have a look at it, which is all about business unique contribution and really being clear that every business has a contribution to make to many different disasters, including Ebola. And it's not just the health sector that need to be thinking about what they can do, but just listening to what people have said um, in already and just talking to different people in um, the sector, whether it be government, NGO, or business, about what's needed. It's not just to help the vaccine to support all the PPE, which is a new phrase to me, but the, the suit, the physical equipment that people need. But it actually, there's so much more that's required, and every business should be able to consider what maybe they can bring to bear. Um, and I think the, the key insights that I think we've been understanding over over these last couple of weeks um, that this crisis has been unfolding. Well. First of all, we've been very much working on understanding the concept and sharing that insight with others. Because, of course, at the very beginning of this um, outbreak, it was very much happening in West Africa over there. And only now are people beginning to understand it's going to really impact over here, wherever over here is. And I think that's something that we've begun to see has taken much greater and stronger hold. And so we've been working closely with DFID and OFSHA to try and help mobilize, mobilize business on, on the agenda of addressing this crisis. Um, we're reaching out and engaging businesses and also international NGOs as well. And I think it's really been important, and it still is really important, to understand the need on the ground, who's doing what, and, and, and how they're doing it, and who's who. Who's who on the ground, and who can, who, everybody needs to be collaborating, and who could business be thinking about working with? Obviously, UN OCHA, obviously other UN organizations, but also the international NGOs, but who? who and where. This sort of thing needs to be better understood by business. Um, and then understanding, of course, the relevant business support in this context. Um, and as I say, it's not just about the health piece. It's not just about the equipment piece. But there are so many logistics issues, supply issues, all sorts of issues to consider, which many businesses can support on. Um, and then, of course, all this has to be considered within the humanitarian, social, and political context. And when I was doing the early research on this in the first few weeks of the outbreak, it was clear that many businesses are very, very concerned, A, to help, but B, to do it in the right way in the appro in, in, within the appropriate context and to make sure that they were seen as making a contribution, but that their contribution was just part of the contribution. But I think people are very nervous and, and very concerned about what should they be trying to give apart from the money. And of course, cash is always king. But many businesses don't have the cash to give, but they have a huge amount of resources, services, skills that they can bring to bear. And I think that's really important to understand 
indeed what is needed and therefore what businesses, which businesses, which departments of which businesses can help in this agenda. And the example from UPS is a, is a great one, showing the full range of the things that they're doing to, expect, to share what they're doing. But the same with the GSK. It's not just about the vaccine. They've been doing many other things, too. And I think the other thing I wanted to, to bring to light was the importance, the, the deep importance, which I suppose doesn't really need saying, but at the same time does need saying. And that's the importance of the coordination and the collaboration between all parties on this, um, on this, on this crisis. Um, talking um, a lot to DFID, who are, are doing great coordinating work in the UK, and also talking to OCHA, UN OCHA, about what's needed, where it's needed, how it's needed. This is something I think is a real challenge. Um, we need to find some better ways and faster ways of mapping it. So reinforcing some of the points that were made just now about how we need to really try and find faster ways of making the connections and, and delivering the support. And as, as has been said, understanding the need, and the need is in cash, it's in kind, products, services, and skills, and then the importance of advocacy and amplifying the messages that um, the UN, DFID, and other organizations um, are putting out, understanding those so that business can go on to amplify them is really important. So coordination and collaboration, I think, is vital for this going forward, and we look very much forward to working with business to help them address this issue, but also working in partnership with them, um, even share with DFID, with international um, uh, NGOs. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sue. And as you were speaking, um, I saw that we had so many participants uh, contributing in the poll question that's also on the screen, what is the main contribution that companies can make uh, to the Ebola emergency? And the response is they're really uh, mirroring, uh, I think, the points that you were making regarding the variety of contributions that are needed. So a, an, an important emphasis on cash, donations, but also in-kind, also, um, uh, also expertise and skills transfer. Uh, so, so very much, uh, I think your, your comments are very much in line um, with the overall feeling in, in the virtual room here. Um, so I'm just going to check and see who we have ready to go. So Alan, we're going to check your audio. Are you on the line with us now? I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Yes, we hear you well. Uh, good. So, so that's very good. So I'll just um, I'll briefly introduce you before giving you the floor. So we have um, uh, with us, as I mentioned, Alan Knight, uh, who's with ArcelorMittal. Alan has uh, over 25 years of experience uh, working with global and national companies and governments on sustainability, and has been with ArcelorMittal since April uh, 2014, April this year, as their general manager for corporate responsibility, uh, and also, uh, if I understand correctly, ha was involved in the past with uh, BITC. Um, so Alan, very um, pleased to have you with us today. I also understand um, that you're currently chairing the Ebola Private Sector Mobilization Group, uh, and we look forward to hearing a bit more about that from you today. OK, thank you. Um, I did send some slides. Um, but I, I'll just draw the slide just sort of for information as uh, some takeaways. Um, so firstly, me as Arthur and uh, I joined really to help the company think about CSR and sustainable development. Um, they were doing a lot already, but um, it was time to sort of move on. Um, but of course, very quickly, if you think about the dates, I joined in April, and that's when people started talking about Ebola. Uh, and it was about June. June to July, we realized that this was going to be a deeply serious issue. We had done a lot preparing our own staff and our own companies. And by the beginning of August, if you remember the news, we suddenly realized that we wondered what other companies were doing. And so we held an ad hoc telephone conference with some of our sort of fellow mining companies in the region. And we realized there was a great potential to collaborate. Um, 50. Um, now we have 50 companies in the group. Um, half of them are actually in three countries, and the other half are in the surrounding countries. Um, and various things we actually do as a group. Um, we actually have six calls, and we now have working groups in each country that were most severely affected. Um, and so let me sort of list some of the things 
we, we now realise the pilot sector can do. And I think that's the most important issue we're now working on uh, and have been for ages is protecting our own employees, bringing them up to speed with the disease, telling them what, telling them what facts are. Um, and I think that comes a bit obvious, but if you think of every company in South Africa have done that, uh, how much different it is and will be. Um, obviously, we, we make it clear to them their family, their neighbours. And the reason we're at this point is a very clear contribution. And if you look at some of the figures of, of infection, the people who work for companies have done that versus you know, people in villages or work for themselves, the numbers are quite silly, going to be very stark. I and mean, we, we employ 3,500 people, and we've only had one infection. Um, so, so there's some very powerful lessons to be there. We're beginning to outreach into our local communities and take the message to them. But the most important thing we're doing at the moment isn't so much cash contributions, it's also the provision of assets, logistics, expertise. You know, we're not, um, we're not medical people, um, but we are logistics, we provide equipment. And that's what's really happening with these three country groups now. We have very straightforward lists of what we know the government and the local NGOs need. Those groups meet once a week, and we, we provide what we can provide. Uh, and when I say that, you know, it does range from things which seem to be quite trivial, like buckets and Wellington boots, but some quite substantial stuff as well, like the, the equipment and the actual people to build roads. Uh, one of the medical centers in Sierra Leone has actually been built by a mining company. Um, so, so these assets, um, we did a list very quickly. And we already got to $2 million we've given in the last sort of couple of weeks of assets and equipment and in-kind support. Um, so what we now have in each country is coordinated private sector groups working with the key contacts in the United Nations and country groups, trying their best to link what we've got with what they need. Um, I say it's 50 companies at the moment. 50 companies sounds like a lot, but imagine if every single company in West Africa was doing the same thing, how much it would make. And the last one, which sounds a little bit sort of PR and self-serving, um, but it, it needs to be said because it really matters, is trying your best to keep the economy going. Um, you know, there was a lot of sort of bad feeling that some businesses had run away from West Africa. In fact, the opposite is true. Um, you know, just we're paying wages, we're paying contractors, we're doing the best we possibly can in an impossible situation to keep the economy running. And when we know how serious the economy is being impacted, so the more we can do to keep that that, that impact low um, is really is really important. Um, the other thing we're just beginning to think about as well, because it will really matter, is if the short term is eradication of disease, there is a medium and long term agenda as well, which is recovery and learning. Um, what do we have to do now? What are we going to have to do in six months' time, 12 months' time to repair macro and micro economies? Um, and you know, I think this is a really important conversation, which one obviously the, the, the private sector can lead. Uh, what can we do to our community programs to address two issues which seem to be a, a coming up as iconic, which is um, stigma and orphans? I think the last thing I heard is there's 4,000 orphans now. Um, you know, these, these figures are terrible. Um, and I worked, before I worked for Arcella Mattel and BITC, I worked for SAB Miller. You know, and we did there, we did a lot on HIV. This is like HIV in fast motion. And what I mean by that is it's terrible and it's cruel, but actually there's an awful lot the private sector can do to, to manage down this disease and manage some of the social and sort of economic consequences of it to make them not as bad. The other thing so I think we also need to do, and this is very much going into the sustainable development field, is actually learn some of the deeper lessons. This isn't a priority now, but we mustn't forget to do it when the disease dies down. You know, the, the relationship we have with nature, um, you know, lots of talk about fruit bats and, and modern culture clashing with, with modern culture. You know, some, somewhere in all of that sort of complex thinking, it's probably some of the causes why this disease bit and bit so. Um, so we're going to try and carve out a space in our group for that as well. So, 
So that's what we do. We're 50 companies working together as one group for the whole issue and as, as country groups if we've got operations in those countries most impacted. The country groups focus on the most important issue of the day, which is just doing the best they can to eradicate the disease. The supply chair, which is the umbrella group, actually sort of does some of the more longer term thinking, advocacy work, you know. Um, we speak direct to the sort of United Nations group, so they're on the top group. Uh, which is the Global Ebola uh, Response Coalition. So we're one of that sort of group of 20 people coordinating the overall response. So it's a very good platform to, to work from. So you know, if you're interested, my contact details are on the web page. Oh, sorry, are on, on the deck of slides. And we're in the process now of building a web page. We don't have one at the moment. And we're in the process of sort of finding an institutional home and actually making this a proper organization. Because at the moment, it's just a club of 50 companies working together. You know, I think in about four to six weeks' time, it will have a proper strategy, it will have a proper governance structure, and a web page and identity, uh, which is helping us prepare for the long-term thinking. So I think that's about my seven minutes, so I'll shut up. Uh, sorry I missed the earlier presentations. Um, but if there's, any, if there's a discussion, I'm ready to answer questions and clarify points I've made. But thank you for listening. That's Excellent. me. All right, great. Thank you very much, Alan. And I do see um, at least one question coming in uh, specifically for you. We're going to hold on to that one uh, until the Q&A, uh, if you don't mind, Emma. Um, but thank you for your question. And please, uh, anyone else with questions, uh, do, do bring them in, as I said, throughout the presentations. Uh, we're going to try now to bring in our final um, panelist, Craig. Uh, Craig, could I just test your audio and see if it's working properly now? Um, Marcus is telling me uh, I should ask you to click on the phone symbol uh, or the microphone symbol at the top of your screen. Um, okay, so Marcus is going to work on bringing you in. Um, let's see, in the meantime, I think, uh, let's see. OK, so in the meantime, uh, Alan, I'm going to um, read out this uh, question that came in for you. Sorry, we're having just a small, small technical problem here. OK. OK, great. So, Alan, um, Emma uh, Hare had a question for you um, saying, how is the EPSMG engaging with NGOs and IN, uh, IGOs? Um, pointing out UNICEF is the leading humanitarian organization uh, working with children, of course, um, and also supporting orphans, uh, which you mentioned, as well as wider communities, and would like to know uh, if there's any scope for us to work together. So, uh, Ellen, if there are any um, uh, possibly examples that you could bring in, or if there's any uh, already any um, uh, work uh, between uh, that consortium and UNICEF that you might be able to point out, or with any other uh, international organizations or NGOs. So, Alan, I'll just go back to you. I think you're still on the line. Yep, force yours, Alan. Yes, I am. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you well. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a good question, and there's several answers to it. Um, when we have that fortnightly calls, if we've made contact with a particular NGO or body who wants to talk to that group, um, they do. We've had Red Cross present. We've actually got UNICEF presenting next week, only for like five or six minutes, but it's enough to sort of state the case and plant some seeds. What tends to work better is not a single relationship with one NGO uh, and the whole of the, um, the group I've just talked about. We seem to be a bit of a matchmaking agency, whereas one or two companies might choose to work with a particular NGO and follow something up. Uh, and that's happening quite a lot. Um, my company in particular you know, has sort of gave quite a sizable financial donation to Red Cross, and those sorts of conversations continue. Uh, a lot of the sort of groups you describe, particularly the United Nations ones, dial in, then the more than welcome, it's a very open group, so they tend to dial in to um, be fortnightly calls. I think we have about 100 to 120 people dialing in now, uh, and I'm up about 150 in my database. Three quarters of the companies, but the other quarter are, are government officials, United Nations, and some of the NGOs you would list. 
and they just have to ask me to be on that list. And the other issue, the other way we're working together is at country level. Um, at the moment, it is the country level which is doing the important work. Mine's a bit of a sort of a think tank, uh, safe space to talk and share information. But the important work on the, of the day is done at the three country groups. And again, NGOs are welcome to turn up at those groups talk about what they need, and that should then give them the sort of resources they want. It's very open, um, and it's a very loose group at the moment, and so that's why I sort of say, to some extent, we're a matchmaking agency and a hub to create functional bilateral agreements between one group one group, and one company. Um, and we're getting back now drawing a list together of what all those, those sort of relationships would be, and, and they're quite impressive. Thank you. Over. OK, great. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, so I'll just check if we have Craig. Yes. Uh, Craig, if you could try speaking, and we'll just see if it's working now. Hi, Anger. I'm very sorry about the question uh, issues. Oh, no, no problem whatsoever. Uh, no, that sounds great. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, do a really brief introduction, and then I'll, I'll give the floor uh, over to you, Craig. So. Um, uh, yep. So, well, as I as I mentioned before, so I'll just say uh, quickly again. Uh, Craig is director of health at the GSM Association, um, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from him uh, today uh, regarding partnerships, multi-sectoral partnerships, uh, facilitation, and uh, response timeline. So, Craig, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much to, uh, for organizing this uh, very important discussion on. The and business interaction and, and engagement in response to the I think it's it's very powerful. I think uh, the active discussion that we, we, we should have turned into uh, eight hours longer. And um, brief in, in a couple of points and, and really just give some practical uh, response or feedback from what we're seeing in the ground. Uh, I think to start and uh, and uh, it was quite uncanny given that we were in the mobile industry that we had connection issues. Um, <laughs> we always have uh, a standing joke within the GSMA that uh, although we own the mobile industry, uh, we always have uh, issues trying to trying to uh, connect ourselves. So uh, very uncanny and sorry about that. But uh, just for those who don't know GSMA, just very briefly, uh, GSMA is the industry. Eight percent of all the operators of pads around the world, uh, and certain manufacturers, the IT community, uh, entertainment, media, and uh, and increasingly a number of other uh, industry uh, partners and and several relations companies looking to enter uh, mobile in, in a very big way. So we have a lot of reach um, into the mobile industry. We've been involved in. Uh, to FP, as well as uh, Philippines, a number of other areas where we've played a, a central coordination role amongst the mobile um, partners and stakeholders in those countries and in those disaster affecting uh, areas. Uh, and the humanitarian uh, NGO uh, governments, local stakeholders, uh, and local, local sector organizations. Um, I think very specifically on, on Ebola, we've been engaged uh, for a number of months now, um, working both with international organizations uh, like the World Health Organization, uh, UNICEF, the World Bank, um, uh, coordination mechanisms across ANMIA, and, uh, and then at a country level, uh, both with governments themselves, uh, local regulators, and mobile operators, technical partners, and others. So we have a very a broad engagement and, uh, and a number of very specific um, services that we're looking to affect in a, in a very large way. I think the, the, uh, the defining point of mobile, given the ubiquity of, of connections across uh, the West African region, uh, promises a lot of, of potential to deliver not only educational-based messaging services, um, but increasingly we're starting to look more closely at uh, financing solutions. 
we're starting to look at uh, data tracking. Um, we're starting to look at uh, contact tracing um, using different uh, towers and what we call call data records uh, to triangulate positions of, uh, of, of patients, populations, uh, healthcare workers. Um, really a, a, a huge potential that we're seeing is around an increasing uh, need for real-time data surveillance and uh, reporting so that we can make more informed epidemiological responses to, to, uh, to this outbreak. Uh, some very specific um, engagements that we've had with the likes of the World Health Organization, we were asked to coordinate a, uh, a credible, endorsed, locally relevant uh, content messaging system. Uh, so we've been working with WHO on, on, uh, on providing that and uh, securing the interest from mobile operators across the region. Uh, in the five affected countries in, in West Africa, uh, 14 of the 23 operators have agreed to uh, those messaging services across a number of different channels. So, uh, um, find those people who we look at the mobile, so SMS, USSD, uh, IPR, data application, and uh, the operators very kindly agreed to make this available um, for for those uh, those messaging services. We understand that. Uh, Across all the countries, there are already messaging services in place um, that do need to be coordinated and uh, and visited in some way. Um, we've seen a, a huge need that arose, particularly in Nigeria, with a lot of misinformation that was being distributed and and uh, and caused a, a huge amount of concern and actually harm to patients more so than than the number of fatalities from uh, Ebola itself. So we played a big role in, in trying to to distribute uh, vetted, validated, and and endorsed content. Um, and as I said, the the mobile operators are uh, are committed to making that freely available across their networks uh, to to uh, patients and via what we would call uh, short codes. So these are our typical numbers: um, a star triple one hash, for example that anyone would be able to dial to access those messages on, on uh, provisioning that type of, of network functionality and access to healthcare worker services. And then um, we've been in conversations with Ericsson, um, the Earth Institute, with Google, um, MSF, and a number of other um, players looking to, to leverage existing services that they have. Uh, in country, um, so I think I think just in 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 uh, in brief, there's a there's a huge amount that the mobile industry in particular can play, um, or can contribute in in uh, in this response. I think a lot of the assets that are in place in in terms of being able to uh, communicate effectively, uh, transfer data, access call centers and uh, mobile money infrastructures, um, all of those are, are, are being provisioned and, and gearing towards uh, supporting local agencies, governments, and, and humanitarian organizations. And I will, I'll caveat that with some very practical um, feedback, is that one of the one of the big uh, barriers that we're seeing at the moment is once we've made these announcements of the commitments from uh, the mobile industry, we're actually we, we're battling to field all of the requests. And so what we are asking for is a very coordinated response from the different um, uh, sectors and where we're needing some of the bigger international organizations to take a very active leadership role in firstly defining the need on the ground, uh, securing uh, local endorsement from government and local authorities, and then uh, and then being able to translate that into something that the private sector can respond to in a timely and and measured fashion. 
So while there's no shortage of, of, of interest to engage from private sector side, uh, there does need to be some form of coordination so that we can uh, make sure that we, we leverage the potential um, as, as far as possible. Uh, the the uh, the other point uh, to be made is just in terms of in terms of timelines, um, uh, and and this is very specific, obviously, to the mobile industry. Is that we can respond very quickly with service deployment across the networks and a response in in uh, whether that's in in the mobile money or uh, conventional cash transfer or reimbursement. We can respond in a, in a fairly quick time frame but are noticing that uh, there's a significant delay uh, in, in actually securing um, agreements or commitments and, and endorsement from uh, governments uh, to actually deploy those services. So uh, we're needing some, in, in some way, shape, or form uh, to, to structure more generic services and, and uh, products that can then be deployed across a, a regional basis. I think the, the, uh, the risk of what has happened in, the, in primarily the three countries we want to prevent um, from happening across the other at-risk countries that uh, we're starting to focus on now um, very firmly. I think it was Matt who, who said one of, the, one of the four big areas is the prevention of outbreaks in other countries and very conscious that mobile can play a very big role. Okay, it seems we may have, uh, we may have just lost your connection, Craig. Um, thankfully, I think you were nearing the end of your comments and it was uh, a break at, at not the worst moment, but um, uh, my apologies for that. Um, there is some irony, as, as you pointed out, uh, uh, given your area. Um, if, if we are able to get you back in, I just wanted to, um, and hopefully you can still hear me. I'm just checking with my colleague. Okay, we think you can hear. So, um, so Craig, I'm just going to uh, put a question out there uh, that came in while you were speaking from Brianna in New York. Uh, and if we're able to get you back in, it would be great if you uh, would be able to address the, um, the point and then question being, uh, given recent reports that SMS messages are not trusted sources of information, what are some ways we can increase the trust of communities in SMS messages. Um, so hopefully uh, that's getting back to you and uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring you in uh, again before too long. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I wanted to uh, first of all just point out, as we mentioned in the beginning uh, or in the registration for the event, any of you um, uh, in the, the virtual audience here who'd like to come in, uh, please do raise your hand. I know uh, in the registration we had several people who were interested in offering examples from their own work and their own uh, organizations. Uh, so if you'd like to do that or if you'd like to ask a question live on the air, uh, please just click the raise your hand hand um, button. Uh, oh, great. I see we have one. We have one person raising their hand. We're going to come to you, um, uh, him is MB, uh, in just a couple of minutes. First, we're going to go back to Chris uh, to see if we can bring him in for an answer to that uh, immediate question. Uh, so keep those hands raised. We will come to you. And Chris, let me try and give you the floor. Hi, great. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. So um, I may have missed uh, some of the question. I think it was around the trust element um, on mobile messaging. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, how, it, how it's possible to increase the trust of communities in SMS messages uh, given the context that in many uh, situations they're not considered trusted sources of information. Yeah, sure. So I think, I think this relates back to uh, the, the very critical need for uh, what we would term uh, multi-sectoral partnerships. We're moving beyond public-private partnerships and realizing that we need multi-sectoral partnerships. Uh, in, this, in this case, the mobile operators or, or the mobile stakeholders are, are, are simply distribution channels, and we need incredible endorsed uh, uh, providers of content um, to be that trusted source which is why it is so critical for, for us within GSMA to work with the World Health Organization, 
with UNICEF, uh, with the World Bank, and also with uh, with local stakeholders, with, uh, with governments. Uh, so if we can do joint marketing, both on, on mobile as well as radio, television, and other to drive the, the communication strategy of that, uh, that trust element, and we believe it needs to come from from governments and uh, from from locally trusted uh, authorities. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to turn next to uh, Jared Mechner uh, from Henry Schein, who I uh, believe is um, ready to uh, to give us a little bit of information on on the work of Henry Schein, uh, specifically around the Ebola response. Um, so Jared, we're going to be unmuting you, and I'll wait for the thumbs up from my colleague. Okay, it looks like you should be live, so I'll give you the floor. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, thanks again for the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, let me quickly describe Henry Schein for those of us who may not know the company. We are based in New York. We are the world's largest provider of healthcare products and services to office-based physicians. And as part of that, one, we are one of the world's largest providers of personal protective equipment, or PPE. Earlier in the uh, webinar, you may have heard from uh, colleague at UPS, Joe Ruiz. We are working with UPS to ship uh, lots of PPE to West Africa. In fact, earlier this week, we announced a partnership with CDC where Henry Schein and UPS together will be shipping the PPE uh, to CDC for their use in, uh, in protecting health workers uh, uh, in Africa. Henry Schein also works with uh, many of the major NGOs, including MedShares, AmeriCares, uh, Direct Relief uh, International, uh, among others. And uh, to this uh, question of how businesses uh, can participate, I think one of the critical uh, uh, issues is we all need to participate in a way that is natural uh, and in keeping with what we do. So. In the case of Henry Schein, we're a big supplier of, uh, of uh, healthcare products and services, so that's what we uh, focus on. One of the things that we do that uh, I think might be a learning for uh, the group is to get involved uh, in these processes before the crisis occurs. So, for example, I mentioned the NGOs earlier. We have a program at Henry Schein called the Global Product Donation Program, and we regularly, and by that I mean weekly, are shipping product to our NGO partners. That way, when a disaster strikes, they don't have to come to us for product. They already have it. It's in their warehouses, and they can begin shipping right away. So one of the benefits of this program is that as soon as the situation in West Africa emerged, our uh, NGO partners had product from Henry Schein uh, that they were able to get uh, in country. Uh, since then, we reached out to CDC, and they were very happy to uh, work with us. So again, this notion of putting systems and processes in place in advance of a crisis we find is critical to really uh, doing uh, the necessary work of uh, containing the um, uh, uh, the outbreak. Obviously, we uh, need to do a lot more, and we will be doing a lot more, both as a community uh, and as well as uh, Henry Schein. But there's a notion of getting in front of things. So what I'm hopeful for from this discussion, and I've uh, also had this discussion with uh, Alan Knight of Arcelor Middle. I'm also a member of the group that he has founded, uh, uh, the Ebola Private Sector Mobilization Group. It would be tragic if after this uh, um, a moment in time, we don't continue to take the learnings of this crisis and apply it in the immediate future so that we're ready for uh, the next inevitable outbreak. So uh, that's my contribution uh, to the discussion, and I thank you again for the opportunity to say a few words. Absolutely, and we're very glad you could be here. And thanks for um, for being the first brave participant to come on the air. We really appreciate that. Uh, we did have another um, hand raised from Himizimbi, who's calling in from Namibia. Uh, we're going to try to bring you in. Um, well, let's see. We're going to uh, try and open up your audio connection there. Okay. Uh, 
so we may have uh, we may have lost that connection. Um, so we're going to move instead to our uh, first round of questions. Um, going around to oh, sorry, um, backtrack. I think we do have uh, Himizembi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly on the line. If you could try speaking, uh, so we could test your connection. Uh, and let me ask you to click uh, at the top of your screen. You should see a symbol that looks like uh, a microphone or a telephone. If you could click there, that should open up your audio channel, and then you can try to speak. Okay, so uh, we're going to have to move on, unfortunately. Um, sorry about that, but I, I did see that you had some comments coming in on the chat, so please do uh, keep those coming in. Um, so we're going to go around uh, around our panel uh, with a, a round of questions here that have been uh, coming in during the discussion. So first, a question from Helena, who's um, uh, here with us in Switzerland, in fact, asking, how can private sector uh, or corporates actually support to address not only the immediate health response, uh, but also facilitate that economic impact of this uh, outbreak is buffered. Uh, so that's a first question from Helena. And then I'm going to uh, pack in one more here. So this is a question from Hiba, uh, who's in the US, and also uh, echoed with a similar question from Liz. Uh, Hiba wondering, um, multiple UN and development partners are approaching the same global companies with different asks. And she's wondering, how can that be streamlined and better coordinated? And I know we've, we've heard a bit already today uh, regarding different uh, coordination and information sharing uh, mechanisms, um, but considering uh, what a great um, uh, emphasis there is on this in a number of questions that are coming in in the comments, I'd like to, uh, to put Hiba's uh, question up there uh, for the panel to see if we can draw out any additional insights uh, on that. So let me go around um, uh, those that we still have on the line here from our panel with these two questions from Helena and Hiba. And I'll go first to Matt, if you're still on the line, Matt. Uh, we're just going to unmute you, Matt, one moment. OK, Matt, you should have the line now. Great. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll answer Heba's question and, and maybe leave it to our uh, private sector uh, panelists to answer the, the, the question on the, uh, on the broader economic response or economic impact. Um, so the, the obviously coordination, there is a large number of, of UN and NGO and civil society actors that are all working to respond here. We do know that there's tremendous in, interest, as I, I mentioned in the beginning, from the, the, the private sector. Um, uh, the uh, UN is, is coordinating uh, uh, under UNMIR, under the new mission, um, uh, coordination with uh, all, private sec all the private sector focal points uh, within within the UN agencies, and we're expanding that to include the NGOs. Um, obviously, we'll, we're, um, we're trying to track uh, all the, uh, the calls that we're getting in. Um, I'll say in a moment what the, the, uh, the, Ebola, the Ebola website that we're using is. But we're tracking those, uh, those, those requests as they come in. We're taking phone calls on a daily basis. And we are sharing those with, um, with, the, with each of the UN agencies that are operational so that we can direct the interest um, to the to the agency most appropriate to, to receive those. Um, obviously, we've been working really closely with uh, coalitions, um, having um, Alan's, uh, from Alan Knight's uh, coalition led by ArcelorMittal and other mining companies across West Africa has been extremely useful because we can also direct um, the assets that uh, those those companies have on the ground directly to some of the NGOs and um, and operational agencies that are that are functioning within the three affected countries. Um, we are uh, utilizing uh, and receiving interest um, from businesses um, and, try and matching those against the, the needs that are being updated uh, continuously, all on the, uh, the UN's website on that, and that is uh, www.un.org uh, slash Ebola response. And on that, you'll, you'll find, um, if, you, if you click on the What We Need tab, um, you'll be directed to our business engagement guide. That will help um, uh, allow businesses to provide the services that they are that they are able to provide, and that will also help us um, matching 
system against those recipient agencies that are ready and prepared to implement those. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, so before we uh, continue through the panel, um, I see uh, Himizembe's mic is back on, so we'll give that one more try. Um, we should be able to hear you now if you could try speaking. Okay, so that doesn't seem to be working. So we'll continue uh, then through the panel. So we'll be turning next to uh, to Joe, uh, and then just to give everyone uh, a heads up. So we'll go in in the original order: uh, Joe, Alan, uh, Craig, and then Sue. So uh, Joe, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, it's a very important question, and it, 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 really a statement to make sure that um, you know business continues to move to to maintain the economic. Uh, uh, economics of those uh, countries, uh, I will tell you that we have seen some challenges with um, uh, the air capacity into these countries as certain airlines are being, um, you know, uh, told that, um, you know, if they land in those countries, that their rights would be restricted or, uh, in other countries. So I think, again, this collaboration between countries and the private sector and governments is, is critical because there are um, businesses that want to continue to support, um, you know, the initiative. Um, but w what we've seen is sort of a restriction of capacities, and then also some of the services that are needed uh, in, in collaboration with some of our partners, uh, understanding uh, from them that. Um, uh, it, it's getting more difficult uh, for some of the private sector organizations to maintain their staffs uh, who are operating in the region, uh, perhaps uh, providing ocean shipments into the ports. Um, you know that there may need to be health care uh, provided to um, uh, access to those private sector organizations that want to continue to support in those countries. Uh, but who, whose employees have fears about accessing uh, health care in some of the clinics, which have been, as we, as we know, um, the, the health care systems uh, are, 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 are severely challenged uh, in country. So those are some of the things that, uh, that we hear uh, and see as we continue to try to respond and support um, the, the needs on the ground in those countries. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so we have, uh, for our next speakers in, in the lineup here, we have a couple of uh, additional questions I'd like to add to the list, if you don't mind, and then we'll circle back around um, uh, to Matt and Joe. Um, but uh, here are a couple of additional questions to add. So first, um, we have Tabo in Zimbabwe asking, how is the current Ebola response building future local capacity? Um, and then I might add, if at all. So um, uh, looking at the, the, global, the uh, local capacity uh, question. Um, and then there was another question coming in from Kepra uh, in the U.S. wondering what safeguards are being put in place to avoid uh, so-called disaster capitalism, in big quotes, um, and other types of potential corruption. Uh, so is this a risk? Uh, and if so, are there uh, safeguards being put in place um, to avoid that? And then uh, finally, a, a very specific question um, coming in from George, wondering, do businesses hold large stocks of PPE, uh, which they acquired for the bird flu uh, response, and which are now available for donation? Uh, and are these of use in an Ebola outbreak? So a technical question. Um, and what organization could it potentially be, the BITC, uh, BITC uh, that could be a coordinating organization? to uh, to get those uh, PPE where they would need to go. Uh, so uh, apologies for the long list of questions, but given the, the time, uh, this seems to be the most efficient way uh, to go around. So we're going to be turning next to Alan. Uh, Alan, if I could bring you back on the line. OK, Alan, yeah, you should here. be on the line. Yep, yep, we hear you. Yes, yeah, I am. What question do you want me to answer? <laughs> uh, you you have your you have your pick, Alan. So uh, so just to yeah run through them really briefly. Okay. Here. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah. You can take uh, your pick. The core, the core, 
the corporate, the, the capitalism one about how do we stop people, how do we stop corruption getting in the way. Um, this has been talked about a lot, um, and you know some of the discussions I've been involved in or of witness with some of these new trust funds. It's absolutely clear they're trying their best to make sure that doesn't get in the way. Um, one thing I've observed though, which is a slight counter to that, which Sometimes I'm feeling that the conversation to avoid that from happening is actually stopping some companies from doing uh, what they might be able to do. You know, there's, you know, I've had conversations where we've said, we were going to give this truck away, but we realized we could obey our governance um, because we're going to give it to a local government official because he needed it, but we're not allowed to give things to local government officials. So it's a really important question, but there is also another side to that question, which is how do we make the make sure that standard good practice protocols to avoid that happening in, in a world without Ebola is actually stopping pragmatism and generous gifts from actually happening. So it's, it's a double-sided coin, that one. Uh, it's an important issue. I'm not, I'm not pushing back on the, on the asker of the question, but I'm seeing another dynamic from that question, which is actually some, some things aren't happening, which might have happened, which would have been useful. So that's my Absolutely. response to that. Yep. Excellent point, Alan. Um, so, Sue, we're going to turn to you, and uh, you have a, a list of five or six uh, questions uh, which have been posed, and uh, feel free to, to answer one or, or as many as you'd like to address. Over to you, Sue. I'd love to address all of them. It's all rather scary to have five of them to look at. Um, so, I thought, um, I think Alan's, question, Alan's answer is a, a really good answer um, about, you know, one, one person's corruption is another person's needed gift, if you know what I mean. And it's so difficult to get that right. And we've seen that many examples of that, not in Ebola, but in many situations. And it's, as he, as he said, an easily asked question and a very difficult question to answer. Um, in terms of the question about multiple UN agencies going to, to one, or one business and how can that be better organized, I think... Um, there are lots of lots of issues and questions there around it. And in fact, this morning I was talking to um, to my colleague in Diffid and talking about how we can better coordinate the asks and the offers. And um, you know, it is challenging, and it's a very very fast moving environment, and that and that's obviously part of the challenge and part of the, of the, of the problem. Um, what what I was wondering, um, actually, in this whole spirit of there's lots of useful things that business can do in this space, actually. Um, getting business who are very good, for instance, at call center handling, who are very good at managing offers and putting them out to the right places and doing the right things with them, actually asking some of those types of businesses with those types of skills to come in and try and help um, make more efficient the asking and the offering that's going on would be really helpful. And I think some of that sort of brain type would be very useful to try and help make more efficient this whole, this whole process and, and try and get to the nub of some of these questions faster and the answers faster. Um, so I hope that's a, a, an interesting and different way of looking at it. But I think business have a good role to play here and, and could really be useful. Um, in terms of the question of how, how are we helping to support the local capacity building, um, that's such an important question and something I think all of us are very aware of in any disaster situation. And um, I think we need to keep our heads up and make sure we're looking at this question at the same time as we're dealing with the, with, with the unfolding tragedy that's, that's kind of happening. So no, no particular answer to, say, to, to give there, but just to say, Tabo, it's a very, very good question again. And then um, the, the question of do business now, what was the question? Ah, about the bird flu, the bird flu um, uh, build-up that, 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 was, that was brought together. And could we, could we do something about that and could we use that? Now, I think it's, that's a really, really good question, George. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know whether the, what was brought together and, and stockpiled for bird flu is relevant, could be relevant to the Ebola um, outbreak. That would be an extremely useful question to have the answer to. And it would be extremely helpful to know who had did stockpile on that. Having spoken to the NHS in the UK, NHS supply chain over the last few weeks, just to try and get one part of government to talk to another part of government in case the um, supplies that are required do actually exist and can be sort of transferred more efficiently. Um, 
the issue of the bird flu stockpile was brought up, um, and somebody was at one of the hospitals, the largest hospital in Europe was, that happens to be in the UK, was saying, you know, this we are used to doing this sort of thing. We should be thinking about this, and I think that's a very, very good question. This is UN. Can you answer it? Is it are these are these products um, useful to this particular crisis? And if so, let's 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 have a look at that. Um, and then I can't remember what the next and the fifth question was, um, but I'm sure you'll remind me. I'm just looking to see uh, what we've been through. I think you've covered them all, Sue. Uh, it was a fantastic set of answers. Very much appreciated. Well, I, I don't think any of them were good enough, but I think that what's so important here is to get the questions. Yeah. And I think that who are in the room, if they can ask more questions and give us these things to think through, that's it's such a valuable output for, for this webinar. Absolutely, and yes, I'll just take the opportunity to mention, of course, there's a huge amount of information uh, being exchanged here, as you can see on your screen and, and here through your headsets. So uh, as we do with all of our events, we'll be uh, producing a report that's pulling together all of these uh, different levels uh, of communication and different channels uh, for everyone's uh, benefit and hopefully to keep these important uh, exchanges and discussions going. Um, so now I'm going to circle back um, to Matt uh, and then Joe. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we need to bring, uh, bring Craig back onto the line. Uh, so going back to you. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I think uh, just in, 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 uh, in very brief response, I know we, we're running out of time. I think um, just the, the the whole notion of uh, facilitated coordination, which is which is really critical here. And um, there was a question around uh, how can we how can we coordinate the multiple responses that are are going back towards private sector. Uh, we think that needs to be governed or managed by a uh, a, uh, a a technical organisation, but without uh, unnecessary time delays on actually implementing. That, that's the that's the 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 critical critical thing that we're seeing at the moment is the uh, is the time delay of of coordination. So if we can understand how to how to uh, get that in place, the governance structure of that, uh, really understand the the need on the ground, and then translate that back into a very tangible ask to uh, to private sector. I think it was mentioned earlier is. Uh, how do we get some of the brains from private sector to assist in translating the the, the very critical needs into uh, into an ask to private sector? I think that would be one very practical example of uh, of of what we could and should be doing. Excellent. Thanks very much, Craig. Um, so uh, now, uh, apologies for, for the hiccup there. We are going to now be circling back to Matt and to Joe uh, as we do that. Um, so to Matt and Joe, we have a, a few new points that have come up here, so I'll just just briefly uh, recap those and, and invite you if you would like to comment uh, on any of them. So there was the point about uh, safeguarding against corruption. Uh, there was a point about building local capacity. Uh, and then this uh, more technical uh, question about the bird flu stockpiles. And it would be interesting to hear um, uh, if you know uh, if there is an answer where uh, that answer could be found to, to George's inter interesting question. And at the same time, I'll ask you, um, uh, both Matt and Joe, if you uh, have any closing comments, um, we very much welcome those. And then once we hear from, from the two of you, we'll uh, go back to the rest of our panel for very, very brief uh, final comments. Um, so back to you, Matt. You should have the floor. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so just very quickly, in terms of building on local capacities, I mean, this is always the the, uh, the modus operandi for the UN and for our NGO partners is to work as much as possible uh, with the national governments, obviously first and foremost with civil society organizations. We're also working very closely and, and reaching out right now. Um, I know through my colleague uh, uh, Karen from the mission who's on the ground in, in Monrovia working with a local business community. Um, uh,
uh, which has as, as much at stake in, in, in this as, as anyone. So building that local capacity with those civil society organizations and national government and, and, uh, and uh, local businesses is key. Um, in terms of the, the bird flu issue, uh, you may know that the UN's efforts on this on the ground uh, and globally are being led by Dr. David Navarro. Uh, he has been um, involved in all of the uh, pandemics that we've seen over, the, over recent years, including bird flu. He's very much bringing in the technical and, and uh, coordinating expertise from uh, so certainly uh, anything regarding the, 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 the technical requirements uh, uh, and, and linkages between bird flu and, and, and Ebola have, uh, have been looked at uh, and will be continue to be used as, as learned. So maybe just to, 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 to uh, wrap up, uh, just a few things. Uh, one, number one, we appreciate opportunities like this. So thank you to PHA, uh, PHAP and to business in the community for allowing us to come together. I think we've uh, we had a cre uh, key critical callers on the line representing the, um, the industries that uh, we've been working with most. But again, to say we're quickly expanding uh, those relationships and, and uh, looking at other areas where other industries can be coming in and, and playing a key role. We ask for business-to-business -business coordination because uh, it's difficult enough for the UN to, to coordinate all the public actors that are on the ground. So the degree to which businesses can also be coordinated through their coalitions, uh, Joe Ruiz talked about working with competitors. This is fantastic. We need more of this. Um, if businesses are coordinated and we can be reaching out to uh, a few key individuals, uh, it makes our coordination, our overarching coordination role of the United Nations that much easier. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you, Matt, and thanks for being with us today. Uh, we're going to turn next to Joe. Uh, Joe, do you have any uh, reflections on these last points and then uh, closing comments from your end? Oh, I, thank you again. Um, I, I, Matt said it very well. I think the only thing I'll add to, to what Matt said is from, from our perspective, the, the uh, reason that we're able to uh, provide support is, is because of the um, partnerships that we, we develop in advance of these disasters, and I would encourage all private sector organizations to, uh, to, to develop those partnerships in advance because when something happens, um, UPS and, and our unique humanitarian relief program have already provided um, funding, emergency funds, in-kind budgets, and so it's, it's very um, direct and, and, and quickly that we can put together the uh, uh, solutions with our partners and, and um, so for us that's how we address the coordination issues. We, we, we work with partners on preparedness and capacity building, providing technical expertise uh, and again that's one of the things that private sector organizations can do if they don't have tremendous budgets to be able to support um, emerging uh, disasters that um, if it whether it's technology or logistics or um, health um, expertise, um, those things um, can be provided um, with those partnerships in advance. I think uh, Gerard mentioned his program uh, working in partnership with NGOs in advance so that these PPEs can quickly be provided to the locations and there's no delay. And I think uh, it's more important to uh, reinforce that these relationships need to be in place in advance because it's very difficult to field responses from a private sector perspective. We get flooded with uh, many well-intentioned organizations who are not connecting. They just want to they want to move supplies and and products. They may not be their proper uh, PPEs. They, they you know we, we we haven't vetted the quality, but we know if we work with with key partners like Henry Schein and others that we know that we're getting quality quality products and they're already vetted. They're working with organizations like the CDC and you have to be working with organizations that are operating on the ground. And for any private sector organizations out there to find organizations that are actively working on the ground, there are many sources like the Center for International Disaster Information, um, Interaction, um, you know, can provide you with lists of organizations that are actively uh, engaged in, in this and, and any other uh, disaster. So my message is the uh, ongoing uh, partnership is critical to uh, our ability to uh, help our partners, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And that's all I have. Thank you again for inviting uh, UPS to be a part of the call today.
Excellent. And thank you, Joe. We really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Uh, now we're going to move through uh, in order Alan, Craig, and Sue for very brief closing remarks. Over to you, Alan. OK, I'll keep this short. Um, in my previous intervention, I talked about this being similar to HIV. Uh, for many of you in the room, I'm sure you've been involved in that. Don't, don't let that point go, because it is very similar. Um, but one thing which makes this one a little bit different um, is the, the issues about perceptions and the current public debate. Um, now, one which is very different to HIV is this whole issue about travel. There's a lot of pressure to close down borders, uh, close down commercial routes, and that battle is being, and that perception is being won. The more we close down the borders, the harder it is to get help in and out of the country, and the harder it is for people to volunteer to go in that country and help. Um, so it doesn't mean British Airways should start flying again tomorrow, um, but we mustn't sort of create this, this sort of iron curtain around these countries where we can't get people in or out to help, to help them. Um, the other thing I'd ask you to sort of think about as well is we're talking about this very much as a West African problem, but we know that it's happened in we know it's happening in the United States and there's something happening in Germany. A uh, question I would ask you as employees, as communicators, is are you ready to educate people you know should it happen somewhere near you? You know, I saw a couple of weeks ago that school which used to have a child who went to Liberia a few months ago. I've heard some, you know, some people aren't allowed to go into their offices because they visited the country a few weeks ago. Um, we've got to really help keep the, the sort of the frenzy. We've got to have an informed debate about the risks, and we've got to manage down the sort of some of the frenzy type conversations you're seeing on the media and in, and in public places, um, because this disease is going to pop up in one or two places around the world outside West Africa, and let's be ready and let's handle the debate intelligently like we did in the end with HIV, but we didn't at the beginning. Otherwise, this thing could get very messy and people could overreact. It's serious, it matters, but let's, let's make sure we have an intelligent response where, if it happens near us. Um, because it's very easy to contain near us. We know how to do it and we're doing it well, but we've got to make sure that the public reaction is, is proportional to the risk. And I, what I'm seeing in some parts of the world, that's not the case. Um, so, so obviously we focus on West Africa, but let's just have a few moments to think about what happens if it happens near us and how do we keep the public reaction balanced and intelligent. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Craig, uh, also for being with us today. Uh, and over to you, Sue, for the last word. I'm, I'm so sorry. I had my, my names mixed here. So thank you, Alan. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and we're going to Craig next. My apologies. Thank you, Ingrid. I think uh, just very briefly from, uh, from my side, and, and a huge vote of thanks again for uh, coordinating this. Uh, the potential of, of private sector to contribute to the Ebola response, not only in the five uh, uh, affected countries across West Africa, but I think considering the, uh, the forecasts that we're looking at over the next couple of months, we need to consider a, uh, a very scalable uh, a response across, uh, across the world. And for, for that to happen, we need a very coordinated uh, uh, response effort that is, that is led by international organizations that have the capability and the capacity to rally a, a diversified um, stakeholder group, but that also very critically, and, and we've seen enough of those, that the, uh, the, the, the failing of those groups is that they do not include uh, local stakeholders. So our very big request is that we, uh, we include local stakeholders or authorities in that, uh, in that governance process uh, in engagement with, uh, with private sector. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, and thanks for being with us, Craig. Um, and now back to you, Sue, for the last word. OK, th thank you very much. Thanks so much indeed. I think um, from visiting the community and, and for me, uh, my, my, my final points would be quite succinct. It would be about the vital importance of um, cooperation and coordination, which has been mentioned by many, and that collaboration is, is essential in order for us to be able to address this 
in an efficient and effective way. Um, and so from co cooperation, coordination, collaboration, it's all about communication as well. And for those communication and advocacy messages are to be shared and amplified by business. And then for businesses to think about their, their contribution, their unique contribution to what they can do in this space and to think creatively about that. So I think that's really important. And then lastly, you know, to, 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 to other points, you know, Ebola was over there, it's now coming over here. And I think it is really important that we consider what are we going to do about that, how are we going to approach it, and how are we going to be able to be better organized ourselves. If this country has already been impacted by this, 15 more are in, in the zone, as it were, but it's going to come everywhere. So we really need to think deeply about how we're going to manage that within our own business and our own market. The last thing I want to say was thank you, everybody. Thanks very much um, to you and Ocha and to PHAP for fantastic uh, platforming of this webinar and for everybody's contributions. It's really, really helpful, and I hope it's been a really valuable um, cont uh, contribution for everybody on this debate. And thank you. Great. Many thanks to you, Sue. And I'll just um, follow right up on that with a, a big thank you to everybody who's been involved today, all of our uh, partners. There's been a huge amount of uh, work going into the preparation for today's discussion and, of course, all of our active participants. Uh, we'd like to invite all of you to keep the discussion going, uh, for example, by joining the World Humanitarian Summit discussion that is dedicated to the topic, the power of business in emergencies. You see the URL on the slide in front of you there, www.worldhumanitariansummit.org slash WHS underscore business. And we know there's an active discussion ongoing there and invite you to join. Uh, we'd also like to point out the next in our uh, regular series of events that we're hosting here at PHAP in support of the World Humanitarian Summit process. Uh, right now we are focusing deep uh, in the eastern and southern Africa region where the on-site uh, two-day regional event is coming up uh, in, in just a, a week or two. It's coming up uh, very soon. Um, and we've been going theme by theme for a really in-depth um, look. And the next one uh, is coming up next week on Thursday, on the 23rd of October. We'll be looking at the theme of humanitarian effectiveness and um, uh, really working with the participants on the call to look into what are the top regional priorities in the eastern and southern Africa region. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave you for the day um, and invite you to, uh, to continue the discussion again, as I said, on worldhumanitariansummit.org, on Twitter, and of course to check out the webpage of our organization PHAP at phap.org. It's been a pleasure speaking with all of you, and I look forward to having you in our next event. This is Inherit Lang signing off from Geneva.